so take a moment to look up from Facebook and please join me in welcoming the founders of Right Social Daily, Erica Anderson and Eric Telford. Well, thank you, Alan, for that wonderful introduction. It's always uh, fun when you're out at a bar to get a call from your parents saying, the neighbors just called and said you're the second worst person in the world. We're so proud of you. <laughs> just fix this microphone for taller people here. Well, thank you so much, Alan. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you to the Steamboat Institute for having us out. Uh, our colleague, Bill Murphy, who does Right Social Daily with us, uh, was going to be joining us. Unfortunately, had a personal a situation arise and was unable to make it, but don't worry, Erica and I are twice as fun, so you will be well served. Um, I'm Eric Telford with the Franklin Center, as Alan mentioned, and pleased to be joined by Erica Anderson. Uh, as Alan pointed out, we run Right Social Daily. You can go to rightsocial.com, and our Twitter information is up there as well, so we wouldn't be doing our job if we didn't ask you all uh, to follow along. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end, and what we do, and if that's something that you're interested in getting involved in. Uh, just really quickly to get a read on the room, how many of you are on Facebook? That's very good. How many of you are on Twitter? How many of you have a blog? How many of you are on YouTube, have your own channel? How many of you have a kid or a grandkid who shows you how to do things on your computer? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, the hardest part about presentations like this and, and the point that we want to make is ultimately how everyone in this room can make a difference. And so if you're afraid of technology, don't be. There's so many things that we can do to help you and it's, it's there, you know, there's so many things that aren't that high of a bar that can allow you to have a huge impact. That's what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. If you wanna learn how to use these tools and you're a novice and you wanna get involved, it's always harder to delve in and, and teach those kinds of things here. So we've got a stack of business cards. We both have associates back at our offices who can send you resources or guides or even get on the phone and walk you through signing up if you're not involved or engaged, but our goal today is to talk a little bit about some case studies that um, show the impact of online tools and how it's transforming our political landscape, uh, and talk about some effective strategies that everybody can get involved in. So with that, I wanna talk about a major challenge that um, we face as a nation with the rapid decline in the mainstream media. However, from our perspective, this is a huge opportunity. Uh, this is a study conducted by the American Journalism Review that shows a 30% loss uh, in the number of reporters covering state-level politics from 2003 to 2009 as mainstream media uh, is bleeding profits and laying off reporters left and right that can't afford to support journalists who can tell us what's happening at our state capitals. Now, we know that uh, the biggest threats to our freedom and prosperity occur when nobody's paying attention. It's at the local school board meetings where uh, the media doesn't bother to show up and report on it. It's in those committee hearings where nobody's there to tell us what decisions are, um, are being made. The ironic thing about this study, as you can see, it ended in 2009 because they ran out of money to continue the study. <laughs> the larger point here, though, is that old media is dying. Of course, it still, has, uh, it still has a lot of sway. It can't be ignored. But when you look at radio, newspapers, TV, uh, they're on the decline in digital tools. All of the resources we have available online are vastly increasing in influence. We're facing a major paradigm shift. The way that we consume and use information has fundamentally changed in the digital age. Never before have we had so many tools at our disposal, and studies show a major loss of trust by the public in mainstream media institutions. People don't trust what's being reported on TV or in their newspaper anymore. What people do trust is what they hear from their friends. And I'm sure many of you see this. If you go on Facebook or on Twitter or what your friends email you, um, that is where people are getting their information now and it's a very self-selecting media environment. We decide who we follow on Facebook. We decide who we follow on Twitter. And so the connections that you have, you have the ability to influence them, and in fact, I think a responsibility to make sure that we get the right information out to the public um, in an effective way. Um, I think the other aspect of this is that when you look at old media, TV, radio, print, you could get angry and write a letter to the editor but they would decide if they published it or not. You could get angry and call talk radio, but there's still a producer there deciding whether or not your call makes it through. Uh, you could call the TV station and tell them to cover a story, but they got to decide. There's nothing standing between you and your ability to get a message out using these online tools, and that's why we see them 
as so uh, successful and so effective. And in fact, if you write that letter to the editor, you have to read the article, go to your computer, type the letter to the editor, and send it to them. Right now, you can act as soon as you get the information. You can tweet it out, you can share it on Facebook, you can email it to people. Uh, you can be an activist or an information sharer right at the moment you're consuming the news. There are three important areas that we're gonna touch upon today that we think you should at least be aware of. Now, you don't have to be somebody who sits behind your computer all day being an online activist or, or helping on, on any of these fronts, but I think you should at least be aware whether you're a donor, an activist, a supporter, an elected official, a candidate, if you work at a nonprofit, you should know that the, the impact that these tools have and the importance that they, uh, that they hold when you think about strategies or you think about ways not just for yourself to get involved, but for those organizations and other efforts that you're aligned with. Uh, so we want to talk about politics and advocacy. We want to talk of quickly about campaigns and elections and the shifting um, tide of media and journalism as well. Biggest thing I get when I talk to people about this topic is, okay, so you're on Twitter, you're on Facebook, you have a blog, you're preaching to the choir, you're talking to a small bubble of people, doesn't actually make an impact. I hear about things like Obama's big data and that's what makes the difference. I want to give a few examples that I'm sure you're all familiar with uh, that wouldn't, would never have been possible before the advent of the internet. How many of you remember Dan Rather? We can now call the former anchor of CBS Evening News because of a report he ran on uh, President Bush's National Guard Service during the 2004 re-election campaign. The mainstream media picked up this story well beyond CBS and it became a major issue in the campaign. And a conservative blogger posted the documents uh, that Dan Rather had used as the basis for his story. And it was actually, I think, a typewriter expert in Montana who looked at the documents and said, the typesetting used to create these didn't even exist yet in the year they were supposedly created. Commented on the blog, the blogger picked it up, forced the mainstream media to cover it, which uh, forced an investigation that led to Dan Rather's downfall. Never would have, could you imagine somebody calling CBS News saying, I'm a, I'm a typewriter expert in Montana, and I've gotta tell you something about Dan Rather? I don't think it would have made it up the food chain. Uh, George Allen, how many of you remember former Senator George Allen from the state of Virginia? He was headed toward what looked like a landslide re-election to his US, Senate, his U.S. Senate seat in um, in 2006, and in fact, many thought he was the leading contender for the U.S. Uh, Republican presidential nomination in 2008. That was until a video tracker following him got on, on his nerves so much that he pointed to the guy and said, and Makaka's here, he's been following me to every event. He claims it was a term he made up at the uh, seat of his pants um, right at the moment, but liberal bloggers found an ancient Moroccan racial slur uh, that apparently is associated with that term. It became the defining issue of the remainder of his re-election campaign. Sad thing is, George Allen could have stayed in bed during his whole re-election campaign and been handily re-elected, and unfortunately he didn't. Uh, but this YouTube moment brought down his political career. Below him, Van Jones. Do you remember Obama's green job czar? Uh, Van Jones was a prominent official in the Obama administration who wasn't really properly vetted, certainly not by the media, but wielded tremendous influence. Activists across the country, citizen journalists, bloggers, started to uncover all of this information from his past, his, uh, his involvement during the riots uh, of Rodney King in LA and him being in prison saying that he's a socialist and had actually said that these green energy initiatives are a tool to redistribute wealth to impoverished African American communities. It wasn't reported by the mainstream media. It started picking up traction online, Glenn Beck picked it up. The first story the New York Times ran was Van Jones resigns. Before that, they didn't even touch it. Never would have happened in the age of just the mainstream media. In the top corner, former Congressman Bob Etheridge, 2010 was a major year for Republicans uh, sweeping control of Congress. But Bob Etheridge was considered probably the safest Democrat incumbent in the country in a rural North Carolina district. In fact, the, the state Republican Party wasn't even gonna put up a nominee against him. A Tea Party activist who'd never been involved in politics, Renee Elmers, a nurse, decided, that's not right. Everybody deserves a challenge. I'm gonna run against my congressman. And thank God she did. A, uh, a student confronted Bob Etheridge as he left the US Capitol building and asked him about his vote on Obamacare. And rather than responding, he grabbed the, the student by the arm and started twisting it and you can hear the student in a, in a video saying, let me go, please let me go. And he was being very aggressive 
anyway, the video went viral, and that is why he is now former Congressman Bob Etheridge. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Anthony Weiner, I'm sure I don't need to go into the details of that, <laughs> of that story most of you are familiar with. <laughs> but that was something that happened going into a Memorial Day weekend where most of the media was probably off at the beach enjoying, enjoying a holiday. And conservative bloggers and social media activists picked up on it and wouldn't let it die. And they forced the media to cover it. And if they hadn't done that, Anthony Weiner would probably still be a congressman or even climb to higher office. But they did. They forced his resignation. And in the following uh, special election, a Republican won that seat for the first time in over 100 years. Again, all of these never could have happened before the age of the internet. So when you say, does this have an impact? Can I, as one person using these tools, even if you're just sharing something, emailing it to people, hitting that like button on Facebook, retweeting it, um, you can have a huge impact. So it's important because it drives mainstream media coverage, it influences the public policy agenda, it increases and enhances activism, and it spreads our message to a broader audience. One example you guys may have seen in the past week or so with Governor Rick Perry uh, in Texas indicted on two felony counts from a district attorney who was caught drunk driving um, the other year. She had, I think, three times the legal uh, blood alcohol limit. She was in charge of the public integrity unit, holding politicians in Texas accountable. Uh, I don't know, have any of you seen the video? Raise your hand if you've seen the video. Not just the arrest video where she can't even walk a jagged line, but once she's booked, she's kicking the door, she's screaming for the sheriff to come let her go, she's being verbally and physically uh, abusive to the people who have taken her into, into custody. Now, what I thought was really odd when I saw the article, I got a Google or a Politico news alert to my email saying Rick Perry indicted on two felony accounts. I clicked the link and I read the article and it said, Rick Perry threatened to veto funding to a district attorney who he wanted to resign, blah, 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 moving on. And, uh, and then I saw all this stuff erupt on Twitter about Rosemary Lemberg and I thought, they don't mention her name. They don't talk about her drunk driving incident. They're just trying to um, impugn Rick Perry and not explain the context of why he threatened to veto that funding. Should somebody who's driving around with a half-empty bottle of vodka, um, who's in charge of public integrity in the state of Texas, have a multi-million dollar budget? Rick Perry thought no, and he threatened to veto it unless she resigned. That wasn't included in the Politico article, but. By that night when I got home, it was the only thing I saw online, and it forced the mainstream media to cover it. And in fact, it got to the point where the New York Times and Obama's advisor, David Axelrod, have called this um, investigation inappropriate and clearly uh, political retribution. So that shows the power of the internet. I think, actually, I should go back for one second. When you think about Tom DeLay or Ted Stevens, there are so many politicians whose careers have been ruined and they've later been exonerated. And that was because either they lacked, because of the time it happened, the tools or the savvy to fight back. And I think Rick Perry is a tremendous example of turning two felony, indictment, um, two felony indictments against him into a political plus. Now he's the talk of the you know, 2016 field and everybody's rallying behind him. So I think that really, really, truly shows the power of the internet. But we hear a lot about the digital divide, especially in the, um, in the fallout from the 2008 and the 2012 elections. And it's true, there is a major divide between where the left is and where we are online. And a lot of that's not due to any gap in enthusiasm um, from the grassroots on either side. It's a lot of the organizations who aren't taking advantage and using the appropriate tools uh, to, to engage us in their campaigns or their organizations. So in 2008, for example, Barack Obama launched his own social media website. We all know he's a very humble guy. Uh, MyBarackObama.com had two million members, and he used that to organize and mobilize those people. Those two million members hosted 200,000 offline events. They generated millions of pieces of content online, blog posts, tweets, Facebook posts, online videos that got his message out virally across the internet. He used it as a tool to mobilize that army to be fundraisers on his behalf, breaking historic fundraising levels. And it was the backbone of his get out the vote operation that of course led to his 2008 victory. Now in 2012, we hear about the role of big data and how they use that and that they know if he mentioned Big Bird or a country song in a certain area, the impact that that would have on polling. Whereas Mitt Romney, uh, his get out the vote tool couldn't even connect to the internet because they never tested it. <laughs> 
I think $200 million down the drain because they never tested it from the facility it was gonna be run from. Uh, so, so clearly there is a digital divide. But I think one thing that exemplifies more than anything else, the approach, it's not always about the tools, it's about the approach and the way uh, that you use even rudimentary tools to engage your activist. Things that even we can come up with ourselves in terms of tactics if we don't have the tools is the iPhone application that Obama did in 2008. Now you could download this onto your iPhone and it would take all of your contacts and look at the area code from their phone number and then it would prioritize them by swing state and you could start calling through. Now how many of you get robocalls? You hear the delay, the click, how many of you actually stay on the line and listen to them? Yeah, see, I have one hand over here. <laughs> I know I hang up immediately, but if I get a call from my mother, my brother, my best friend, I'm at least gonna take it, I'm at least gonna listen to them. So when people were calling their friends from their contact list and, and saying, hey listen, I'm supporting Barack Obama this November, here's why. I hope you will too. Do you expect that you'll be turning out to vote for him on election day? It would revert back to a screen saying likely Obama voter, unlikely Obama voter, undecided. You would press the applicable button. It all got zapped back to the Obama database for them to follow up or to activate you to follow up. Meanwhile, my phone was getting inundated by robocalls from John McCain or other, other surrogates that I and I'm sure most other people were just, were just hanging up on. And that's about an approach. So more than anything else, whether you do it online or in person, so many of you are involved in activist groups. Just out of curiosity, how many of you are just a citizen, an activist, versus being an elected official or, or with an organization? So if you're an activist, raise your hand. If you're with an organization or an elected official, raise your hand. Would be elected <laughs> official as well. <laughs> well, now that you've stayed for this presentation, you will be. <laughs> Well, we always like seeing more citizen hands go up than, than politicians, so we have a, a better balance here. Um, but it all goes back to the principles of community organizing. Now, this is something we attack Obama for as a punchline. He's a, nothing more than a community organizer, and that's probably the only thing he's good at. So we should give him credit for it. We shouldn't deride it, and we should actually learn from it. This is a, a wheel that shows the principles of community organizing, and I think they're work, uh, worth walking through because they really highlight the mistakes and the the flaws or, or the ineffective use that people or organizations often make when using social media. So first and foremost, I think they said this has a laser. Right there, we have listening. Social media is not about blasting your message out. That's the age of broadcast. TV, newspaper, uh, radio, they all blast a message at you. Again, you can scream back at it, but they're not gonna hear you. You can write a letter to the editor, everything we talked about, but they control the information. What makes the internet different is that it's a conversation. If you want to engage people, you have to talk to them. And when you talk to people, you have to listen to what they have to say too. So I think one of the biggest flaws on our side is that organizations will say, oh, let's use Facebook or Twitter to just post our press releases or push out that ad we made for, for television. Uh, same thing as, as citizens. I want to tell people what's going on. I'm an organizer. Come to this event. Come to this event. You've got to listen. You've got to ask questions. You've got to engage them. If you want people to take time to get involved, take time away from their uh, families, their businesses, their jobs to get involved, you've got to make them feel part of a community and that requires you to listen. And you'd be surprised what you would learn. When I was at Americans for Prosperity, we ran a petition, nostimulus.com, uh, and it was the first time we had tried on a petition putting a field saying, why are you signing this petition? Not just your name and your email address, but why? I think like 90% of the people filled out the why and amazing stories that we got from people that we were able to tell the media uh, so do take that time to listen, it's, it's worth it. And that goes to relationship building. It's not about, oh, I have one more person following me on Twitter who can see what I post. That's one more potential relationship that you can connect with and mobilize them on your behalf or your campaign or organization's behalf to advance your cause or your message. Challenge. A good example of this, I think, is the Scott Brown Senate race, not, not the current one, but when Ted Kennedy passed away and people thought a Republican will never win a Massachusetts Senate seat. But there were people who stood out and said, why not, let's do this. Let's rally people across the country, let's donate money, let's send buses there and send volunteers. If we didn't have people who stepped out in front and challenged people to do more than they otherwise would, we would never win. And so I think it's so important that we remember to always challenge people. And then that goes to action. Give people things to do. Don't just say, be angry about Obamacare. Be angry about Obamacare, make a phone call. Here's the phone number to the US Capitol switchboard. 
be angry about Obamacare and turn out to your representative's district office. Give people things to do and you'll be amazed at what they will do for you. I used to, when I, when I started working in New Media at AFP, complain to our uh, fundraiser, why don't people give us more money to do stuff with the internet? It's so important, we need more resources. And he said, Eric, donors don't wake up every day, every day and say, how can I help Eric? You've gotta ask people. If you're an activist, if you want people to vote, if you want people to make a phone call, you've gotta ask them to do it. Uh, evaluation and reflection, and I think that goes to listening too. Take time to step back. Is what you're doing effective? Are you getting input? Are you doing what you can to refine it and make sure that you're making the best, uh, or, or putting the best foot forward possible to ensure success? And finally, celebration. Sometimes we move on so quickly to the next fight, we forget to celebrate, we forget to thank people, and we forget to include people as a part of that celebration uh, to make sure that they know their hard work was appreciated. So I want to quickly move through here so we can get to, to Erica in just a moment, but how do people and organizations influence policymakers with digital media? When I used to work for Americans for Prosperity, we did a survey in Illinois, and it said that the average state, legislat uh, state legislator would reconsider their position on a given piece of legislation if they got 17 phone calls from constituents. Only 17. Now, that was a few years ago. Things have changed. Tools have made it easier to, to contact them. And perhaps it takes more than that. And especially if we think at the federal level and the number of communications they get, probably takes a lot more. But the great thing about the internet is that so many elected officials run their own Twitter accounts, manage their own Facebook page, that they don't just get the tally from their staff about how many phone calls or how many emails came in on a given issue. You're actually reaching them directly. And some case studies that point directly to that. I kind of have Texas and, and Georgia here, which is a tale of two states. Both Texas and Georgia politically are very red. Republican control, uh, controlled legislatures, Republican governors, Republican congressional delegations, um, and majority Republican voters in both states. When it comes to new media, however, Texas, at least until recently, was actually a very blue state, and that was because of a blog called The Burnt Orange Report. And it was run by a few guys who would go to the state capitol and live blog what was happening during legislative session or stay at home in their mom's basement probably, uh, watching the, the state level equivalent of C-SPAN blogging about what was happening. And when I was organizing an event there once, I had the opportunity to meet with the Speaker of the State House who said, sadly it's gotten to the point where as public policymakers, we're not engaging our fellow lawmakers in debate on issues. We're getting in an argument with a liberal blogger up in the gallery. And if you look out across the chamber, almost every member has their computer screen open to this blog and they're reading what this person thinks of them while they get up and talk. The ability of one person to even just be a distraction to that level in one of our largest states legislatures is incredible. Same thing in Georgia, still a red state, a conservative blog called Peach Pundit. Same effect, if you look across the legislature, there's actually a picture of all of their, their computer screens open to that blog. Uh, it happened in Virginia. There's a blog called Not Larry Sabato, you know, the political commentator on TV, Larry Sabato, well, this is not him. Uh, and this blogger was upset with the way one of the lawmakers voted, put up a post about it. So-and-so just voted out of, outside of the interest of their districts today, and I'm gonna make sure come election time that his constituents remember. It, he then emailed it to the staff of that lawmaker. Lawmaker walked off the floor, staff showed it to him on their Blackberry, he turned around and changed his vote. In California, even though that's a blue state, We've got a great conservative blog there called Flash Report, and the ability of him to put up a post and change the minds or, uh, or votes of elected officials is absolutely incredible. So don't think that you can't make a difference. And in fact, at the federal level, here's a great example from January of 2012. I don't know how many of you remember SOPA PIPA. It was a debate about online intellectual property protections, and there were a lot of major free speech concerns that arose and some other uh, issues of it not being well thought out legislation. And so you can see from the Twitter officially sent out a tweet on their own saying 2.4 million people uh, put out SOPA related tweets from 12 a.m. to 4 p.m. that day. So within one day you have, and these are just a couple examples. When I, when I went online to get these graphics there were dozens. Lawmakers who were not only stating that they flipped their position on the bill, but actually people who sponsored the bill saying I'm withdrawing my Sp uh, sponsorship of the bill, Orrin Hatch withdrawing sponsorship of the bill, Harry Reid in light of recent events I've decided to postpone the vote, Marco Rubio flipping, Roy Blunt, dozens of others. So these are 
Um, but I think examples at both the state and federal level that people can have an impact. If you're just one of those tweets, you're doing your part. You don't have to be somebody who sits there and does it eight hours a day. Okay, I've got like one, two more slides, then I'm done. So it's transforming the way we communicate with policymakers, candidates, and the media, and how they communicate with us. Jason Chaffetz, a congressman from uh, Utah, lives in his congressional office. Every week he sits at the end of his cot and gives a cot side chat to his constituents about what's going on in Washington. Bypasses the mainstream media, gets his message directly uh, to the public. Same way the public can get a message to lawmakers or the media. Make DC listen. How many of you remember uh, Ted Cruz and his 21 hour filib uh, filibuster standing up against Obamacare? He got uh, hundreds of thousands of Americans to, to get behind him on social media in advance that don't go back in I think 2008 or 2009. Nancy Pelosi sent Congress on recess. There was a vital vote that they had to take uh, to extend privileges for offshore drilling. She wanted it to expire. She sent Congress home, shut off the C-SPAN camera, shut off the lights. Republican lawmakers stayed, continued to talk, uh, and just through Twitter were able to get their message out and put enough pressure on Pelosi to reconvene Congress and hold the vote. Uh, after the Iranian presidential elections in 2009, CNN, uh, you remember the protests that erupted that were at the beginning of the um, Arab Spring, CNN was covering celebrity gossip and entertainment news that weekend while every other major media outlet was covering what was happening in Iran. So many people tweeted, CNN fail, that you can see the point where it forced CNN to switch their coverage to what was happening. Final example, and this really shows how off base or sometimes ineffective the mainstream media is. Nobody saw the Eric Cantor loss coming. It was stunning to so many people. The mainstream media said it was inevitable. Polling showed him 34 points ahead, and yet he ended up losing by 12 points on primary day, June 10th. But if you look at Google Trends, which is a tool that shows how many people are searching a given term on Google at any, at any time, in the weeks leading up to Eric Cantor's loss, there was a massive increase in searches for Dave Bratt. And if you look at Twitter, you can see that there was a huge advantage occurring. Eric Cantor had 63 people who were retweeting him, reaching only 206,000 people. Dave Bratt had 834 people retweeting him, reaching more than 4 million uh, people. That is a 20 times greater reach than Eric Cantor had. There were definite signs ahead of time that we could see online digitally that never occurred in the mainstream media, that were never reported. And I think that shows the diminished power that they have. With that, I'm gonna turn things over quickly to Erica Anderson uh, to talk about a few more campaign-related things and the media. And then if we have time, we'd love to take your questions. Thank you all so much. Talking about the Campaigns and Candidacy Act aspect of this, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about how the issue of um, announcing your candidacy see, has changed. In the past, um, and still a lot of candidates actually do this still, um, announcing your candidacy included drafting a press release, blasting it out to reporters, holding a conference call, and then maybe as an afterthought, sending an in case you missed it um, email to bloggers. It, bloggers were not a priority, um, they're just kind of an afterthought. Well, things have changed. And one great example of that is Senator Ted Cruz and how he um, started his campaign uh, for the Senate. Uh, the first thing he did was hold a conference call with bloggers. Press releases are dead. Uh, I don't know that Ted Cruz even sends press releases. And I would recommend most politicians kind of rethink that strategy because most of the time, um, people are not paying attention to that in their inbox. As a former reporter, I can tell you, um, I get so many of those still to this day, and I always hit delete, because you've got to get my attention in some other creative way. Um, what did Ted Cruz do second? He tweeted out that he was running for Senate. Um, Twitter has been a huge, huge priority for Ted Cruz, um, and he does a lot of it on his own. Sometimes his staff does it. Um, but he's made it a huge priority, and it's made a major difference. Um, another person that did this, we already talked about him, Rick Perry. 
Um, he also announced his candidacy in the same way, and in the same way, he's also made Twitter a huge priority. Um, and if you look at it, Ted Cruz and Rick Perry are two of the most popular people in the Republican Party right now, and that's not an accident. Um, it's because they've made um, new media, Twitter, social media, and all of these platforms, bloggers, they've made them a priority. And it shows, because they bypass the mainstream media and get their message out in the way that they want to get their message out. Um, and, and I think that's a trend that other politicians need to follow. Um, you know, and what that does is it, instead of giving all of your information and your power to the mainstream media, you're empowering your supporters and giving them the power to support you online and get the message out. Um, and, and both Cruz and Perry and, and several other politicians, they continue this practice while they're in office. I mean, I know as you know, working in the political field, working in journalism and communications um, in D.C. since 2006. Um, I, I mean, I've met Ted Cruz probably five or six times and it, because he makes himself available to people um, on a regular basis. He's the guy you see at the blogger conferences. He's the guy that comes to the bloggers briefing at the Heritage Foundation that we host every, every month. Um, he, he's accessible. He's, he's not an elitist. And I think that that is something that a lot of politicians need to, to keep in mind. Um, other politicians that you might take note of that are doing it right online include um, running for Congress in Maryland, Dan Bongino. I'm highly impressed with him. You should see the kind of stuff he puts out on his Facebook page and how personable he is, how he runs his Instagram account. He's talking about all kinds of things in his life that he thinks are interesting. And, and it's not just policy and politics. He's a real person, and that's why people like him so much. Um, so I hope he wins. Um, other people, Marco Rubio, President Obama, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, John Cornyn, Mike Lee, Kathy McMorris-Rogers, and Cory Booker. Um, I wanted to showcase people from the left and the right um, just because um, I think that, you know, we need to, to learn from both sides. And I'm forgetting to do my PowerPoint slides. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, um, so those are people you all wanna, you want to, uh, to look to. Um, now, in addition to the changing landscape for how politicians announce their candidacy and run their campaigns, um, the media is completely diversifying, and, and that's something that we really need to pay attention to. Um, the, uh, the nation's leading newspapers, they decrease in readership every year. The New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, every single year you see their reach is going down. And that's because we're seeing the rise of all these other websites that are bringing information. People are consuming news in a different way these days. Um, people are watching less television and consuming more news than on, on their devices on different websites. Um, and the American Press Institute study actually said that Americans prefer different reporting sources for different subjects. So someone's not gonna go to one place to get their news on every subject. That's why we have a lot of specialized um, websites and that's due to a lot of citizen journalists, bloggers, and people that have created these new platforms um, that specialize in information and, um, and, and have become really important. Um, a Pew Research study also um, showed that the growing digital news world is largely comprised of hundreds of smaller sites that are working to fill the gaps left by legacy reporting. Um, the smaller influencer trend is, has become a part of this. In the PR and marketing world, you can't go to a conference or anywhere these days without hearing them talking about the nature of targeted specialized outreach to various levels of influencers. It's not just the big TV ads, it's not just the big newspaper ads, um, it's, it's about the smaller the smaller bloggers, it's about the smaller platforms because um, uh, th that's where people are, are really, really influenced because it's friends, it's family members, um, it's people that they trust and respect um, and that's where the messages are really hitting home these days. Um, and the other thing I would just say is that, um, kind of Eric touched on this, but policy organizations, politicians, brands, if one person says something negative about them on Twitter, they're listening. They don't want that out there in the public uh, arena and that's why you know, places like uh, Southwest Airlines and different brands have become so good at managing PR on those um, platforms because once it's out there on Twitter, their reputation is going down. And that's why we really need to be paid paying attention to that more often. Um, a study between um, Stanford and Facebook shows that your social media audience is actually four times lar larger than you think it is. So whereas you might think that you don't have a lot of people listening to you, it actually, it, it really multiplies on social media because even if you're just sharing it with your 50 friends on Facebook, um, every action that, that they take, if they like it, if they share it, if they comment on it, that actually is multiplied into the feeds of the friends that they have that you don't have. Um, and there's just so much more potential than you think there is, which is why I wish people would um, realize how important it is that they use these platforms um, 
for themselves and um, to get the information to the bloggers and the websites. Sorry, I'm trying to speed through this because I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, According to a recent study, 92% of consumers um, trust recommendations from friends and family over other advertising. I would say that goes the same for policy, politicians. You're going to be much more likely to pay attention to um, an issue that your friend is talking about on Facebook rather than if you get a banner ad from a politician. I mean, you're just going to breeze past that. But if someone's giving a thoughtful perspective on something on their Facebook page, on Twitter, or perhaps in an op-ed in your local paper, you're going to pay attention to that a lot more. And that's why it matters. Um, and 81% of consumers are influenced by their friends' social media posts. So that goes to show you how powerful it is. Um, we've seen this working in so many ways. A school choice is a great example. Um, there were um, a ton of smaller voices working tirelessly to make it known how important school choice is and how kids are hindered by it if they don't have it. And, and what do you know, school choice is thriving across the country now. Um, people have become um, knowledgeable about the negative consequences of Common Core. Um, there were two movies made about the school choice and uh, movement. Um, and it's people on the right and the left coming together. And I think it's just such a powerful example of how smaller voices made a big difference. Additionally, uh, Live Action um, is an organization started by a woman named Lila Rose. She was, uh, you know, she hated what Planned Parenthood was doing and she wanted to expose it. So she went in there undercover with her own cameras and recorded what, what they were doing. And then she sent it out um, just from her own platform. And what do you know, people could not ignore it because it was so powerful and exposed some of the awful things um, that, this, that this organization was doing. And their reputation has since declined and it, she continues to make um, these videos, and I'm sure you've all probably seen a lot of them. Um, one uh, last example, um, James O'Keefe of Project Veritas, um, he um, did the same thing as Lila. He went to uncover voter fraud, um, green corruption, and most recently, border insecurity. Nobody funded him to do this. He um, went out on his own, he did it, and now you'll see CNN, Fox News, all these major networks, they refer back to what he's done because it's legitimate reporting that can't be denied. And he did that on his own without anyone um, telling him like, hey, we're gonna pay you to do this. He just did it. And there are so many other bloggers and journalists out there, or citizen journalists out there doing that now, and it's really important that we empower them and get them the information that they need. Um, and coming to a close here uh, shortly, uh, the rise of right, center of right sites. Um, here at the Heritage Foundation, we've created the Daily Signal. Um, there's also Rare, IG Review, Breitbart, Free Beacon, Daily Caller, The Blaze, and many more. Um, for a long time, all conservatives had was Fox News, but that's, that's changed. Um, these websites, I, I can tell you, I, I look at the traffic numbers, they're, they're off the charts, I mean millions and millions and millions of people are going to these websites every month and people are getting information that they wouldn't have otherwise gotten. And I can tell you at the Daily Signal, um, we you know, pride ourselves on reporting underreported stories um, and we think we're doing some really important work um, just like a lot of these bloggers and citizen journalists um, do. Um, last example I'll give is there are some influencers, they don't have blogs, they don't have major websites, but they're making a name for, oh sorry, yeah. It's hard to do two things at once. Um, they're making a name for themselves um, just on Twitter. Um, Holly Fisher, Holly, she's known as Holly Hobby Alabi. You, uh, many of you probably saw this picture. She posted a picture of herself holding a gun and a Bible in front of an American flag. She was just being, hey, I'm patriotic. Well, a liberal you know, took the picture and they started calling her the American Taliban and putting it up next to this picture of this, um, uh, this soldier. Uh, obviously, that was a little disturbing, but Holly fought back, conservatives on Twitter fought back for her. She went from 30,000 to over 50,000 Twitter followers within like two weeks. And she has just had such a, she's made such a difference in getting the message out for conservatives. And I was so intrigued that I asked her to come to Heritage next week and talk to us all about how she's doing it. So um, you can actually tune into that live online next Tuesday at noon if you're interested. Um, so to, to close on this, um, Eric and I are working with um, all of these bloggers and influencers every day um, through our work with brightsocial.com and just through our work with Heritage and the Franklin Center. Um, and if you want to learn more about these individuals, making sure that they're heard and making sure that your messages are getting to them as well, we'd love to talk with you. Please feel free to get in touch um, after the conference. Um, here's our information if you want to get in touch with us. Um, Twitter is an easy way. We don't even have our email up there because that's so old school. Um, so, uh, so that's, yeah, that's pretty much all we have. I don't know that we have time for questions, but. And I would just say, if you want to get involved, if there's no time for questions, we'll be around for a while, but 
If you want to learn more or get a hold of resources to learn how you can get on Twitter, get on Facebook, start a blog, if you need help with anything like that, let us know and we'll give you our contact information and have somebody back at our offices help you out. Um, oh, we'll be at the margarita party too. And again, just the, the main takeaway, even if you just forward an email or, or hit the like button or the retweet button, you have no idea how big of an impact that ha that is. Think of the 63 people for Eric Cantor versus the 860 people for Dave Bratt. What a difference that makes. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention that I'll close with, at AFP, we one time were promoting a live webcast, and we had an email list of 1.3 million people, and we sent one link to them to see how many viewers it would bring. We sent another link to an email uh, list of 100 of our top allies on social media, people who would do anything we asked them and had a large following, and we got three times as many viewers from sending an email to those 100 people than we did from an email to 1.3 million people. So don't underestimate the power of you and everyone in this room to tap into our networks all across the country and make a difference.